open to the public and to the press. They are recorded. Uh, cover yourselves accordingly. I would like to administer oaths to two new members. Uh, my good friend, Judge Chris Brasher of the Fulton County Superior Court is now the Chief Judge of the Fulton County Superior Court, and so I'd like to swear him in. And now Judge Walt Davis, where's Judge, Judge Walt Davis? In the corner. He is uh, now officially a judge, and they're up and running, so I'd like to swear him in as the newest member. So if y'all want to come up here, I have an oath. Have people to swear to. Instead of other members, we have Judge Wayne Padgett, who is here for Judge McBurney. Uh, seems like he never left. He's been such a great asset to this council. Thank you, Judge Padgett, for being here. Uh, we also have uh, Judge Rickman, who is here for Judge McFadden. Where's Judge Rickman? Um, hey, there you go. Good to have you here, Judge. And then special guest, we have Chuck Boring. I didn't see Chuck as he just came in. There it is, Chuck Boring's here with the Judicial Qualifications Commission. We have David Amati. Mr. Amati with the Georgia Ethics Commission. That's not the official name, but that's what we'll call it. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we also have uh, Evan Myers. Is Mr. Myers here? He's been invited. Tracy, did your guest show up? Him. Okay. Uh, he's with the House Judicial uh, Judiciary Council, so hopefully he'll he'll be able to attend. Uh, with that, we'll start with roll call. We'll start with my right, Miss Cynthia Clinton. Cynthia Clinton, Director of Judicial Council Administrative Office of the Courts. Good morning and happy Valentine's Day. Good morning. I'm Stephanie Hines with the Administrative Office of the Courts. Good morning, Paul Davis, uh, Georgia State Good morning, Jim Tudison. Good morning, I'm Jeff Kite, Spirit Court Judge of Way Cross Judicial Circuit, First District Administrative District. Uh, good morning, Ralph Ann Pell, <coughs> Seventh District Administrative Judge of Security Court. Good morning, Asha Jackson, Sound Mountain Judicial Circuit, and Fourth Administrative District Judge. <laughs> good morning, Michael Barker, uh, President of Council of Magistrate Court Judges. Good morning, Beryl Anderson, Chief Magistrate Judge in DeKalb County, Georgia, and Secretary of the Council of Magistrate Court Judges. Wes Taylor, Fulton County State Court, and I'm President of Life for the State Court Council. <coughs> Russ McClellan, Forsyth County State Court, President of the Council of State Court Judges. Clark Smith, County Chief Judicial Circuit, Third District Administrative <coughs> Judge. Jeff Bagley, Chief Judge Bell for Side Circuit, Ninth District Administrative Judge. Good morning. May please court, I'm Donnie Gillis. I'm the Eighth District Administrative Judge of Superior Court, and I'd like to introduce um, my successor, Sarah Wall. She is from the Old 
on the circuit. Uh, she will come on when I roll off at the uh, main end of my truck. So, thank y'all. Thank you. 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 Good morning, I'm Carl Brown with the Augusta Judicial Circuit and the 10th Judicial Administrative Judge. Good morning, I'm Bubba Samuels, President of the Council of Municipal Court Judges. Chris Brasher, Atlanta Judicial Circuit, 5th Administrative Judge. Brian Romero, President of Atlanta Council of Superior Court Judges. Wade Padgett, I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Council of Superior Court Judges. I'm a Superior Court Judge in Augusta and I'm standing in for Sean McGraw. T.J. Hudson, Council of Probate Court Judges of Georgia. Brian Raymond from Georgia Court of Appeals. Carla McMillan, Court of Appeals. I'm David Nahmes, the presiding justice of the Supreme Court. And I did mention I'm Harold Melton. I'm Bob Gray, Executive Director, Council of State Court Judges. Tanisha Manuel, Judicial Council, ALC. Laquita Walker, Georgia Court Reporters Association. Charna Furlow, Georgia Court Reporters Association. Brenda L. L., President of the Georgia Court Reporters Association. Doug Ashworth, ICJE. Josh Becker, Council of Accountability Court Judges. Taylor Jones, Council of Accountability Court Judges. Charles Miller, Council of Superior Court Judges. Natasha McDonnell, Council of Superior Court Judges. Emily Mender, Council of Superior Court Judges. Tracy Johnson, Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution. Deborah Nesbitt, Association of Young Commissioners. Richard Danny Court, Administrator for the 1st District. T.J. Dumin, Administrator for the 10th District. Jody Overcash, 7th District Court Administrator. David Nixon, 2nd District Court Administrator. Joe Bodden, 3rd District Court Administrator. Will Simmons, 6th District Court Administrator. Jennifer Bowen, Administrator of the Office of Court. Christine Hayes, Beach State Bar. Bob Bruchshaw, Communications. <coughs> Robert A. Thompson, Council of Executive Office. Judge Sarah Wall, Chief Judge of Tony Circuit. Amanda Baxter, Administrative Law Judge, Office of State Chief Justice, Presiding Justice Nomius, and 
my new best friend, Cynthia, with the ASC for inviting me here. Um, and I'm gonna do something very dangerous. Um, I'm actually gonna correct the Chief Justice on one minor uh, issue. I was actually not appointed by the governor, and I, I get a little bit of trouble when people say that. Um, I was appointed by a bipartisan board made up of appointees by the governor, the speaker, and the lieutenant governor. So I just want to clear that up. I stand correct. So I am the new executive director of the State Ethics Commission, um, and the Chief Justice is right. The, we joke that I have two business cards, one just for the title of the actual agency, and the other with my actual contact info. Um, <clears throat> but I appreciate y'all having me here today. Wanted to introduce myself and, and talk about a few things and clear a few things up. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, or if you'd rather ask them one-on-one, -on -one, I'll be the one over there harassing your new JQC director about when he's having his fifth kid so he can fulfill his lifelong dream of coaching his own semi-pro basketball team <laughs> with nothing but boring children on it. Um, but I did start here about nine months ago, uh, nine months going on nine years. Um, I was brought in to take over an agency with a checkered history and uh, you know the intent is to right that ship and get things moving in the right direction and that involves a number of things uh, that, that the agency had not been doing well enough um, education and, and training being one of them um, there is an enforcement component to what we do but it should also be very important that we cut down on unintentional violations by doing a better job of answering questions and educating on the front end um, but in particular, I wanted to talk about a couple of things that I'm, I'm sure you all are aware of by now. Uh, some violence that are required and some miscommunication that may have occurred in the past. And, and I will say that uh, I've talked with the AG and, and we are working through and, and I'm very happy with the job that Chris is doing. And he's, he's working with, him, with me to make sure we get this thing right. Um, but as members of the judiciary, as elected, judges you have what's known as the personal financial disclosure report and that's due every July um, but because all judges serve on the judicial council you actually get tagged also with having to file an affidavit of public officer and that's due at the end of January unfortunately um, my agency and some people associated with my agency have been giving incorrect legal advice in the past and that led to maybe some confusion and miscommunication. Um, I was fortunate enough to go on a, a conference call with the executive council. I don't remember who all was on there, but I made clear that I, I don't think y'all have done anything wrong. Um, and I'm willing to put my name to that. Uh, we have suspended enforcement of that particular provision until 2021 with the idea that by then everyone will be on the same page, but also because that affidavit is eerily similar to the rule 3.15 filing you have with the Supreme Court, I think it's worth having a conversation and I welcome your input on whether we can look at legislative changes or potentially issuing an advisory opinion on my own behalf that you can use further down the line if you get another director that takes a contrary position and to be clear that director would be incorrect. But <laughs> if a subsequent director takes a contrary position, I think it could be beneficial for y'all to have an, an AO on letterhead and say you don't get to change the rules midstream. Um, but in any event, I, I'm, I'm open to having that conversation and, and coming up with a common sense solution to this. I think as members of the judiciary, uh, y'all got enough to deal with and your time is valuable enough without having to worry about a one page filing. Um, so ultimately, I think my job is to be a direct resource to you. And the presiding justice, justice suggested this uh, a couple weeks ago and, and I've implemented it with my office. If a member of the judiciary calls with a question, it will be directed to me and me alone. There will be one voice. It will be the dulcet tones of David Amati, unfortunately. Um, but I'm here to answer any questions you have and make sure there's no confusion and there's no concern on your end. Um, that being said, I'm happy, and I never thought I'd say this, but I'm happy to take questions from a hot bench if there is one. Um, but if not, like I said, I'll be over there uh, in the corner with Chuck and I'll, I'll stick around through the first break and, and if you have any questions, feel free to come up and ask. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Thank, Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, we've since been joined by Judge Lisa Jones. Good to see you. I apologize for being late. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. And then uh, I think Judge Fornoy walked in. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Judge. All right. Doug Ashworth with the Institute of Continuing Judicial Education. Will you come to this presentation, please? <coughs> Chief Justice, and may it please the court, so I appear before you on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Institute of Continuing Judicial Education to request this council's favorable consideration of proposed revisions to the ICJE bylaws. ICJE exists by order of the Supreme Court, and it is the Supreme Court that retains the inherent authority to modify ICJE bylaws on its own motion or recommendation. Subject to that inherent authority of the Supreme Court, there has been a vetting process that has emerged through custom and usage of the 51 years of ICJE's existence. And that vetting process has three basic stages. Stage one occurs at the ICJE board level, and it has occurred in this case. Stage two occurs at this Judicial Council meeting, and that's what brings me to the microphone today. And stage three, would occur before the Supreme Court of Georgia. So prior to going any further into the revisions, I believe it's proper to pause for just a moment and refresh the, the recollection of the Judicial Council members as to which constituent groups have a seat at the table at ICJE Board of Trustees meetings. In your agenda packet, tab two, you will find a six page document there is a cover page entitled Current ICJE Bylaws Effective January 1, 2012. You will see that the current bylaws provide that the following constituent groups are authorized to appoint individuals to the ICJE Board. Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, Superior Courts, State Courts, Juvenile Courts, Probate Courts, Magistrate Courts, municipal courts, the State Bar of Georgia, the Judicial Council of Georgia, and in addition, the following entities are authorized as ex officio members of the board, the immediate past chair of the ICJE board, the immediate past chair of the ICLE board, the dean of the University of Georgia Law School, the dean of Emory Law School, the dean of Mercer Law School, the dean of Georgia State Law School, the dean of Atlanta's John Marshall Law School, this is the group of constituents that have a seat at the table whenever the ICJE board meets as they are required to meet a minimum of four times a year. In between those four regular meetings, the business is carried on by an executive committee. The executive committee is authorized under the current bylaws and the current leaders are Board Chair Bonnie Oliver, Judge, North, Northeastern Judicial Circuit, Board Vice Chair, Dean Bo Rutledge of UGA Law School. The Secretary and Treasurer is Judge Katie Lumsden of the Houston Circuit. And always included in Executive Committee business is the liaison from the Supreme Court, Presiding Justice David Namias. So the first stage of this three-stage vetting process occurred about, started about eight to nine months ago when Board Chair John, uh, Judge Bonnie Oliver formed a bylaws committee and the bylaws committee reported out to the full ICJE board in December of last year and again in Jan January of this year. So in your agenda packet, you will find a seven page document with a cover page entitled Proposed Provisions to ICJE Bylaws presented to ICJE call board meeting on February 10, 2020. And this document before you contains the exact text of the proposed provisions that were unanimously passed on Monday, February 10, 2020, by the ICJD Board. No changes were made from the text that is before you in your agenda packet. This document contains the exact text that was unanimously approved. You will note in the footer on each page of the proposed revisions a notation that the language that is struck through signifies text from the current bylaws that is proposed to be deleted. Language that is underlined signifies text not in the current bylaws that is proposed to be added. The footer also notes that a version was unanimously adopted back on January 24th at the regular meeting of the board 
after which some inadvertent scrivener's errors were discovered, and thus for the sake of completeness and clarity, the called meeting of the board was convened on February 10th, and you have before you the text that was unanimously approved at that meeting. Now, I'm not going to enlarge upon the court's time by covering each individual proposed revision, but I can summarize the revisions into four categories after which I'll take any questions. The four categories start with the category representing the largest number of changes, and that is a category to provide inclusiveness through gender neutrality. The largest number of proposed revisions accounting for over two dozen proposed wording changes throughout this document is to provide for gender neutrality. For example, changing an existing word chairman to a new proposed word chairperson. That's the first category. The second category is to clarify the membership categories of trustees. The current bylaws provide for both regular members and also ex officio members. The proposed revisions further clarify this distinction by specifically denoting in Article 2, Section 1, that there are two classes of board membership, regular and ex officio. And that brings me to the third category. In recognition of the importance of having the deans of Georgia's law schools represented on the board and as an accommodation to those law schools because they are ex officio, the proposed bylaws, specifically Article 3, Section 3, would provide that the board vice chairperson would be elected from the deans of the law schools who serve as ex officio members. That is the third category of change. That leads me to the fourth category voting privileges. Although it is not explicitly stated in your current bylaws, it is generally accepted practice that ex officio members do not have voting privileges. So again, as an accommodation to the law school, <coughs> given their ex officio status, the proposed revisions would at Article 3, Section 3, provide that the board vice chairperson, although ex officio, would nevertheless have voting privileges. This would ensure that law schools would always have a vote among the board members. Again, this is a summary of the changes. All of these changes were unanimously approved. The exact text is before you. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Before I conclude, I think it's appropriate for me to add a word of thanks. I want to sincerely thank the members of the council sitting at this table who are current and former members of the ICJE board for volunteering 100% of the time that you spend in ICJE board business. So again, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, this is a request for Judicial Council's favorable consideration of these proposed revisions. And for this council, if it deems appropriate, to forward the proposed revisions to the Supreme Court, asking that court to consider entering such orders as it may deem necessary and proper. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ashworth. Any questions? I have one question that's not necessarily related. Um, many times, I know we had some confusion in the past five to 10 years about uh, the extent to which the councils felt like they were informed about what ICJE was, was doing. Um, how often is it that the appointee to the ICJE is actually the same person that is the chair of the training council? My answer is, it is a growing trend and a good one. Good. So, um, um, thinking through the, since I've come on board, it's not my business to tell the councils who to send to the board, but it certainly helps in the communication when the representative is to their educational apparatus is also the representative on the ICJE board. I know, for example, that um, that to be true in uh, superior court representatives, juvenile court representatives, magistrate court representatives, probate court representatives, and that's as far as I can think of my well, that, that, That's an improvement then. Uh, I think that's that streamlined, streamlined communication greatly. Glad to hear that. Any questions about the actual proposal itself? Okay, uh, is there a motion to approve? I think that was Judge McClellan that moved. Oh, Judge Taylor. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion, we have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Great. Thank you, Mr. Ashworth. Thank you, Chief Judge.
Our next item is the uh, report from the Legislative Committee. Presiding Justice Nomis. Thank you, Chief. Um, you have a written report behind tab three um, with uh, a quick status on the items the Judicial Council take a position on support for this session. Uh, the General Assembly, as you know, is not been sitting this week but will reconvene on Tuesday for day 13 crossover day is scheduled for May uh, March 12th um, one major item is to update and modernize the court reporting act and just wanted to update you there hasn't been legislation filed yet but there have been a variety of discussions um, and some progress on the issue particularly conversations with chairman Barry Fleming the House Judiciary Committee and with his staff. And I don't know if Evan Meyer, who is a staff member, has been focused on this, is here. Um, but the, the current plan is to try to, um, is to work with legislative council to take the language that the court reporting committee put together and was approved by the council, um, put it into a draft piece of legislation and try to get it dropped after crossover day um, so we have a working document. Um, this was never thought to be a one session proposal, um, but to get the ball rolling. Um, so we actually have a, a piece of uh, legislation for folks to comment on. Um, and the plan is to do that, um, to implement any proposal on a gradual basis um, so we can see how uh, the plan would work in practice. Um, a second proposal was uh, regarding bond and misdemeanor family violence cases uh, that was sponsored by the Council of Magistrate Court Judges. There hasn't been legislation on that file yet. I don't know if Judge Barker wants to comment on that. We're currently discussing it with some of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee members, and we're going to make a decision on whether we drop it this year or not in the next week or so, and we'll advise everybody of that. Right, thank you. Uh, the third proposal is uh, to adopt the Uniform Mediation Act. This came out of the Commission on Dispute Resolution. Again, no legislation is dropped yet, but I think Tracy Johnson's here. I don't know if you have an update for us. Absolutely, yes. So we've been working with Chairman Fleming and Evan Myers um, with the State Bar. Uh, Mr. Hayes is here. Um, we hope to introduce that legislation soon. We do have a sponsor, so fingers crossed. Okay, so that one hopefully will be moving soon. Uh, and then finally, the committee met by teleconference on uh, January 24th and voted to support uh, an item that's in your packet regarding gross and net settlements and conservator cases. Uh, our proposal from the Standing Committee on Legislation is that the Judicial Council support legislation to clarify the meaning of gross settlement and to define net settlement when the appointment of a conservator for a minor is required. You have the draft language um, and some more information in the package. Uh, this is a potentially something that affects uh, the state superior and probate courts. Uh, the staff's met with Chairman Fleming's uh, office and hopefully it could move soon. And I'll recognize Judge McClellan if you want to just talk a little more, bit more about why this is needed. Yes, sir. Thank you, Justice Nomis. There was some confusion, I guess, among lawyers and among judges about how to read the statute to compute whether or not a conservator was required based upon the $15,000 threshold. And after we talked about it at our council level, we approached the legislative council, I think after the initial meeting, there was a meeting of probate judges and uh, our judge, I think even superior court judges may have been involved um, with Judge Sapp. Uh, Savannah from our council and they came up with this uh, language that really just kind of rewords all of the, the language so that it flows and you can see where that threshold is met or not based upon defining the terms for a settlement and that settlement. This is an action item for the council's support. Is there any other discussion? Any questions? Uh, yeah. um, and this just came up, and I apologize for not being on the call, but there's an issue where cases are built. There, this deals with the settlement. There is nothing that deals with receipt clearly of judgments. And there have been some cases where 
parents are accepting larger than $15,000 judgments because while the code says that they're supposed to do that, it just specifically refers to settlement. And that was causing some anxiety for some of the family judges. I don't know what it does for us. But. And I don't want to throw in at the 11th hour, but I'd rather mention it than not when you can think of it. Well, again, these proposals are generally adopted um, with flexibility of um, our uh, government relations staff to work on uh, with legislative staff. So if that's a concern, I think that's something you should talk to uh, Judge McClellan and potentially could be built in um, to the proposal, which kind of reaches the same end. Um, yeah, I do think there were some discussions about how far to go with with this proposal because there are some other issues that came up it's on our side and on the probate side that we felt like this was an easy one to yeah to, to get fixed and then we can look at the rest of it but we can certainly talk further as it gets to legislative council once it gets dropped i'd like to do a question any, any further discussion so this comes to us as a recommendation from a standing right. committee so it doesn't need a actual motion but is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, anybody opposed? Thank you. Is there anything else? The last item is just on the recommended judgeships from Judicial Council. Um, the Flint Circuit legislation was dropped as House Bill 786 <laughs> and has passed through House Judiciary already. The Cobb and Aguchi proposals are expected to be dropped soon or maybe in the hopper when they reopen on Tuesday. Um, I don't know if Judge Amira has any other comments on that. No, we're just happy that we're making some progress and the others will soon. Okay. And that completes the uh, report from the legislature. Thank you, Judge. Well, Leah, could you kind of bring us a report from the Budget Committee? Good morning. Good morning. As uh, stated on the agenda, we don't have an action item, but we do have a few updates. The Judicial Council presented its amended fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2021 budget request to the House and Senate Appropriations Subcommittees. In the hearings, we were asked, we asked for an additional 375,000 for civil legal services for kinship care families. As you might remember, our initial ask was for 750,000, but the legislature only ap appropriated half of the request. Their position was to wait for uh, performance data before approving the remaining 375 in the amended 2020 budget. The Judicial Council Standing Committee on Grants awarded the initial 375 to Atlanta Legal Aid. To provide services to the entire state, Atlanta Legal Aid partnered with Georgia Legal Services on this project. To fulfill the request of the legislature, Justice Boggs and Presiding Justice Namias worked on the grant recipient, worked with the grant recipients to create the flyer that I have passed out for your review. <coughs> As you can see, the project has been tremendously successful. In less than six months, 393 cases have been handled, 623 children have been served, 79 counties have received services, and the state has avoided an estimated $2 million in foster care costs. The legislature found this data to be very impressive. With these types of results, we are hoping for the remaining 375 to be approved. In the August meeting, the council also approved a budget request for a business support analyst. That request has been withdrawn. The administrative office of the courts offered to repurpose a vacant position in place of this request. Considering that the executive branch agencies are being asked to take four and 6% cuts, the appropriations subcommittees thank the council for withdrawing their request. Lastly, the House Appropriations Subcommittees and Full Committee will meet next Tuesday and the budget, the House Tracking Budget document will be released. I will share documents with the Standing Committee 
after they post. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Any questions? Uh, let me say this as it relates to both the budget committee and the legislative committee. Um, I really do think we have as good of a working relationship with the le legislature as, as we ever had. And a lot of that's due to the understanding of all the constituent groups within the judiciary and the ability to answer questions frankly and directly. Um, they appreciate the level of cooperation they've, they've received. We were told on the kinship care at the front end of this process, we we're gonna have an uphill push. And presiding Justice Namias, Justice Boggs, worked with Steve Gottlieb and the folks at Land Legal Aid, and they really worked on that sheet and provided the data. And what we're finding is if we provide the information that they're asking for, they're, they're ready to hear from us now. So that's the spirit of what uh, of the environment that we're in. And I just want to thank y'all for it. On the technology committee, I will rely on the written report that you will see on tab five. We've done a lot of rulemaking. We're really trying to figure out what uh, is the next, next elephant to attack. <laughs> Judge Christian Coomer will come and present uh, update on cyber security insurance. Judge Tim? Okay. Thank you. You said you were, I keep asking the same question. You said it's due in the next six weeks. Is that six weeks? Is that correct? I didn't mean that. I didn't want to waste your time for you to hear from me. Uh, but uh, our next full committee meeting is March 25th. Uh, that gives time for our subcommittee to pull together the documents and information it needs. It's a uh, pretty big and uh, uh, you know a big ball of wax to get through. Yeah. And so hopefully after our March 25th meeting, we'll be ready to make some proposals to the chief and the council. Right. And that's this is tough work, and I do appreciate you taking the, the helm on this. This is wrapping up this this jointed judiciary that we call United and finding how to how to provide cybersecurity insurance for the whole. Whole ball. Thank you, Judge. All right, so with that, we are moving through our agenda nicely. We'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll hear from uh, our director and other counsels. 10 minute break. <laughs>